Hey there. Hi, how are how you? you good, you? Good, good to see you. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate no, it's my it. pleasure. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> okay, so Mark, it was Metabolic Health Summit about a year ago. I saw you speak about metabolic flexibility, and it was probably one of the most validating moments of my career because this is, I had never heard that term, and I believe it's your term, right? Metabolic flexibility. Did you come up with that? Um, uh, Robin Wolf, Rob Wolf and I started using this about um, maybe seven or eight years ago, but I feel like I've really popularized it because it's become my main focus on, on everything we do. It's really, as I would say, the holy grail of, of health. It's what we're all kind of after, regardless of whatever way of eating we choose to engage in. It's really metabolic flexibility that we're seeking. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, cause I, so my, my whole thing is keto in and out. Right. And I felt like such a rebel when I was coming up with this, I'm like, Oh, I'm like blaspheming the keto world by saying like, well, it doesn't mean you have to be in ketosis all the time, but it is helpful to be able to go in ketosis. So could you kind of explain what metabolic flexibility means? Well, so metabolic flexibility sort of means, uh, this ability that we all have to, uh, access, uh, whatever energy substrate is is convenient at the time in our bodies, and it's not the it's not the ability that we all have. I wish I'm trying to teach people to have that ability. It's the it's the programming that we all have initially. It's the wiring that we all have. But ultimately, uh, what it means is that um, as you go through your day, you're not beholden to a meal every three or four hours to keep your energy levels up. You're yeah. not beholden to a certain level of carbohydrate intake without which you get. Uh, foggy and 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 you know fall apart. You're not beholden to being uh, keto all the time. Uh, I mean, so many times I hear people say, you know, I've I've been keto for you know two months, and if I have more than 70 grams of carbs, I get kicked out of keto, and I feel like crap. Well, that's fine. You're you're getting better at, at keto, but you're still not metabolically flexible if you have that. Metabolic yeah. flexibility basically means that you can drive energy from the fat on your plate of food, the fat on your hips or thighs or belly. Uh, the carbohydrates on your plate of food, the glucose in your bloodstream, the glycogen in your muscles or liver, uh, the ketones that are made by your liver in the absence of glucose in the diet. Uh, and any one of these substrates can be, can be available and present for you to metabolize and convert into energy and keep going about your day and thriving without ever having to stop and think, oh, I feel horrible or I wish I felt better or I should have eaten this or I shouldn't have eaten that. Uh, metabolic flexibility gives you this freedom to go through the day and, and among many other things, to go long periods of time without eating, whether by choice mm-hmm. or, by, or, or by just circumstances, uh, but to be able to, again, thrive in those situations and not have your body even have to wonder or think about where that source of calories came from. It's just this fluid, dynamic situation where you could be doing, uh, you know, heavy squats in the gym, and you're using more glycogen. Fine, uh, you're using more fat to recover. You could be, you know, uh, uh, working on uh, a book or uh, pre- uh, preparing for some argument in a court of law, and skip two meals and be mm-hmm. thriving on on ketones that your liver is making mm-hmm. uh, in the absence of having eaten. Uh, you could be going through your day or two days or three days or four days in a fast. Um, um, very comfortable burning fat uh, for almost all the activity that your muscles engage in up to 85 or 90% of your max effort. This is metabolic flexibility. And this, as I say, is the holy grail uh, that we all should be seeking regardless of whatever method of eating or way of eating we elect to adhere to. Yeah. So somebody might be hearing that and I'm like, yes, yes, this is, this is how I live. I know this is how you live. This is how so many of us live in this like keto primal paleo world. And I know if I had heard that back when I was eating like McDonald's and Taco Bell and ramen noodles and grilled cheese for lunch, I'd be like, well, yeah, that must be nice for you. You're like, you've been an elite elite athlete most of your adult life. Like you're probably just like that. Like, I don't think I could be like that, but I am now. So like, how would you, what would you say to somebody who's like, okay, sounds good. How do I get there? What would you say would be the path of progression? And this kind of is in your keto reset, your book, Keto Reset Diet, but like, what would you say would be the path that someone would take to be able to achieve what you just described? Well, first of all, let's be clear. I was one of those people for most of my life as an elite athlete who depended on carbohydrates. So I was not metabolically flexible. Yeah. I mean, I was better than most, I guess, at at deriving some of my energy from, from fat but I was still fueling that carbohydrate dependency machine 
still having to eat five meals a day, sometimes six, 7,000 calories a day, sometimes, you know, a thousand grams of carbs a day, even when I was one of the top runners and triathletes in the country. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you do a lot of exercise or do a lot of hard work or struggle and suffer that way, that you will develop this metabolic flexibility. Yep. What, what the way to do it is actually quite, I think, painless and, 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 and graceful and easy if you just make the right food choices. And that's basically uh, getting to the point where you are eating only real food, go figure, uh, and uh, that you're cutting the carbs down to the point that you're just gently prodding your body to start to recognize that there's not going to be a lot of glucose for the next couple of hours or a couple of days or a couple of weeks, if that's the case. Uh, and that it's time for the body to kick into its a preordained plan B that in the absence of glucose, it literally starts to build more of the metabolic machinery that burns fat and utilizes ketones efficiently. And that's, again, a very, it's very easy to orchestrate in today's world. And in our uh, distant past, you know, millions of years ago or hundreds of thousands of years ago, or even hundreds of years ago, uh, when we didn't have a regular supply of food three times a day right. uh, with, with, with regularity, the body was very used to saying, you know, just sort of thinking on its own, um, I'm going to come across this supply of natural food. I'm going to eat uh, until I'm full and probably overeat. Uh, the brain is wired to overeat. Uh, the, we're, we're essentially wired to convert excess calories into energy that we carry around with us as fat. That's part of our design. Mm -hmm. It's a very elegant uh, kind of design. And so what we have to do is we have to figure out a way to tap into this stored body fat and convince the body that it needs to, um, to spend some of those, uh, calories, some of that, uh, caloric energy, uh, and, and, uh, and in so doing get us to the next meal. So when, again, a million years ago, when you ate one time every three days, um, you know, you didn't get hangry, you didn't get pissed off, you didn't get low right. blood sugar, you know, you went right into this, fluid, dynamic, elegant system that would tap into the, the essence of metabolic flexibility and derive energy from fat, derive energy from ketones, uh, maybe even burn some of the glycogen that you had um, stored in that most recent meal. And again, very uh, uh, without, without any disruption in thought process or uh, any, any sort of uh, uh, brain signaling going, oh my God, we're going to die. We're going to starve if, you know, right. no, all of that stuff, it's in our DNA. We've just lost the ability to tap mm -hmm. into it. That's the way we've structured our meal times and, and, and our food supply. Yeah, absolutely. And like for us right now, it all feels normal, right? Because this is, we think this is like how human beings have been for a while, but it's really only what, maybe the last 50 years or so that it's been this way before that. Yeah. I always say like, man, if you found a blueberry bush in the wild, you'd be going ham on that sucker. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, I mean, you know, we've heard, uh, I think erroneously over the past <clears throat> several decades, that humans are, are grazers, you know, that we graze all yeah. day. So, you know, that was maybe if you <laughs> if you came across, you know, regular, like the blueberry bush you talked about, and there were blueberries forever, but that's not, that's not grazing. That was another form of overeating. Right. Um, for the most part, um, there was either, you know, food or there wasn't food. Right. And it's not as if there was a great deal of, um, uh, you know, storage capacity where you could put, put stuff in your uh, refrigerator and come back to it, you know, two days later, three days later, uh, you either had, you know, you had access to meat and you better eat it now or it was going to spoil, you mm -hmm. know, in, in two or three days. Um, and so that's, again, it's, it's part of the system, which I think gets in the, in, in the way of many people is we are wired to overeat. So that's, that's clear. The difference today is um, we need to sort of consciously figure out when it's time to stop eating and then know that we don't eat, we don't have to eat again in three or four hours. If we don't if we choose not to. I'm yeah. not saying you can't you can't eat again, but uh, right. as you as you well know, once you develop metabolic flexibility, one of the first things that you understand is, whoa, I was eating way too much food uh, beforehand. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh my goodness, three meals a day is just too much. That's too much food to take in. It's uncomfortable and it takes a lot of time. It's ridiculous right. how much time it takes to 
to, to eat three meals in a day. And so one of the first things that happens when you become metabolically flexible um, is, and your energy starts to even out and you, and you, and you know that you're getting energy, whether it's from your stored body fat or from the food you just ate, um, you know, you, you figure out, um, you know, I'm going to at least skip one meal and most people decide to skip breakfast. I don't know if you're one of those people, but a lot of people who are metabolically yeah. flexible just say, you know what, I wake up in the morning, I've got all the energy I need. I don't feel compelled to immediately sit down and fill myself full of food. So most people who become metabolically flexible um, choose two meals a day. Could be breakfast and dinner, could be breakfast and lunch. For most people, it's lunch and dinner. And then that sort of puts you into this compressed eating window, this restricted time uh, window where you only eat for a period of six or seven hours throughout the day. And the rest of the time throughout the day, um, you're, people say they're fasting. It's just... You're, it's not like you're fasting. It's just that you're not eating. You're not wasting your time <laughs> eating, yeah. filling yourself yeah. full of crap, you know? Yeah. And, and, and as we know from the research, all the good stuff happens in the human body when you're not eating. And so the longer you can go without eating, the, I think the healthier you can, you can become. And again, I'm not trying to press the, you know, press the limitations here. When I'm saying, I'm saying the longer you can go comfortably without yeah. eating, at the end of the day, this is for me, this is all about enjoying life. It's all about enjoyment of life. And part of that is living long. Part of that is being healthy. And part of that is not being hungry, right? Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, one of the greatest things about metabolic flexibility is you just, you don't get that nagging, panging hunger. It, it really gets a, a hold of, of hunger, appetite, and cravings to the point that you sometimes say, oh my God, it's 3.30 in the afternoon. I haven't eaten today. And well, it's a little too late to eat lunch. So I'll just not eat until dinner. And it's yeah. easy. It becomes yeah. this very, again, graceful, easy process that unburdens people of this regular meal time. Yeah. And you start to feel more and more amazing the longer you get into it. It's like it's it's ultimate freedom. I've been I've been experimenting with one meal a day since coronavirus started. And that's been amazing, you know. And I'm, I, you hear these longevity experts talk about what happens when we run out of incoming food. And now we're giving our gut a break to regenerate and heal. We're giving our cells time to turn over and regenerate new cells. And so it's like not only are you saving time and you get to feast. Like when I feast, I feast. I definitely overeat. <laughs> and yeah. it's all I want. And sometimes that's one actual meal is very extended. And sometimes it's like four hours, you know, maybe I'll eat at 12 and a little bit more at two or something like that, but I'm loving it. And it's, it's, yeah, sure. You go to at first that when I was going to sleep, I was like, ah, oh, I'm getting hungry because I'm used to eating at this time, but your body, I always say my body's like a dog <laughs> and it sounds to people. It's like, why is that offensive? I don't know. We love dogs yet. Calling yeah. something a dog is offensive, but I feel like it's just like, I've trained it. It's like, oh, I'm hungry. And you're like, you're fine. And then it gets over it. <laughs> you know, no, it's amazing how it gets over it and it gets over it in, in some regards um like some people I, I will coach them i'll say look if if you really if you think you're a little bit hungry but you're not sure go for a walk you go for a yeah. 10 15 minute walk and that'll take the edge off the hunger right totally or or, or go start back to work on a project that you were yeah you were taking a break from and, and you yep. forget about it so yep. some of this some of this uh, what we perceive as hunger is just like timing like your body your your brain is going, well, you know, it's two 30 and I should have had lunch by now, but I didn't. Right. And it's not, it's, it's not actually the sensors in your body going, Oh my God, we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to die if we don't eat soon. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, getting, getting control of that mechanism and understanding. Um, and I have to say, even for me, like when I cut from three meals to two meals a day, I'm like, well, that's really cool. It's good. And then when I go to one meal a day, which I'm perfectly fine with, which I feel great with, the monkey brain of mine still is going, God, Mark, is that enough food? Are you mm-hmm. going to be okay? Are you going to make muscle mass? <laughs> and the answer is, totally. yes, it is. It yeah. is enough food. Mm-hmm. So we, we, we discover pretty quickly in this metabolic flexibility that we not only become flexible in where the energy comes from, but we become very efficient in how we, mm-hmm. in how we burn that fuel and how we recycle some of the component parts of that fuel. Uh, and so I think, I think for myself, I probably consume 35% fewer calories now than I did even five or six years ago. And, uh, and, and, the, and the sort of weird part about that is I start to wonder, well, even though I didn't gain weight on 35% more calories five or six years ago, the fact that I'm still maintaining muscle mass and strong and healthy and energy and I'm not hungry means that I was... I was eating too many calories. And, and mm-hmm. you know, if you, if you eat too many calories, 
Uh, you may be able to get away with it. You may not show it, you know, in your jeans, you know, or your, or your bathing suit, but it's probably still some bad things that are taking place, uh, or sh shall we say less than ideal things that are taking place within your body. There's probably some amount of combustion of excess calories there that your body is literally doing to try and get rid of, to burn off rather than store as fat or rather than, um, you know, utilize immediately or, um, deaminate the proteins that you've overconsumed and try and pee them out. So there may be some, some um, uh, studies that are coming up in the future that would suggest that, you know, we all this time we thought we couldn't feed the world on what we produce, but that's because we just, we, we overeat so much and we yes. throw so much of it away. There's yeah. We eat plenty of food for everyone. If you think about it, if, if you can develop metabolic flexibility, this is exactly what has come to my mind too. There's a documentary called Wasted and it's all about the food waste from, from the, the crops themselves. They're like, we only eat this teeny parse portion of the plant, but actually all these stalks and leaves and all of this is edible from the cauliflower plant per se, but we just throw it away because that's not the pretty part for the grocery store. And then it goes to the grocery store and half of those are thrown away. And then it goes to your kitchen and you throw half of it away because you don't eat it. And that is definitely something that I realized as I started to eat less and less. And my intuition was just saying, you don't need nearly as much food as you think you do. You don't. And exactly. I thought that too. I'm like, man, we could solve all these problems if we all just like eat less and realize that we're going to be okay. You know, it does, it does solve the world's problems of this overtaxing of our systems. And not only are we, you know, buying too much, but we're, we're flat out eating too much. <laughs> I think for me, I realized like, I was like, man, what I'm eating now in a day, that used to be like snacks for me, <laughs> right. calorically, yeah. you know? Yeah, 100%. <laughs> um, that, that leads me, another thing you said when I heard you at Metabolic Health Summit that I really loved was when you were talking about like all the gadgets, all the measuring, all the, and I like biohacking and I love like the aura rings and the whoop straps and the, it's fun. It's fun to geek out on yourself. But I did notice, you know, when I was racing, I, I run marathons too. And when, when I was racing, I would wear a Garmin cause I wanted to see my splits after the race, but yeah. I didn't want to see my splits <laughs> during the race because I knew it would mess with my head. And, yeah. you know, sometimes I'd see those splits after and I'm like, I ran a sub six minute pace in the, in a middle of a marathon on one of those miles. If I had seen that, I would have freaked out. I would have been like, Oh girl, slow down. Like that is way too fast. You know? So can you share some of your thoughts on getting in touch and being intuitive with your body versus all of the measurement tools that are out there right now? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sort of the anti quantified self guy. And, <laughs> I um, love it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't like the term hacking, biohacking. Um, I think it, it sort of has a connotation uh, and not to cast aspersions on any particular generation, but, you know, millennials and to, uh, of, of trying to find shortcuts. Like, how can, I, how can I find a shortcut and get healthy without doing the work or without, um, you know, undergoing some of the discipline necessary to get there? Is there a magic pill I can take? Is there a is there a 10 minute workout that I can do that'll give me the work of an hour and a half workout? And, um, and I, I, I'm just not a fan of that. I think that uh, all the systems in the human body are, are biological systems that have evolved over hundreds of millions of years and do not lend themselves to quick fixes. You, you, you sort of have to, we have, we have this DNA recipe, this genetic recipe that we all have, and it expects certain inputs. And if you give it certain inputs, the genes upregulate and build certain enzyme systems or build certain protein systems. And, and they'll do exactly what they've been programmed to do for, again, millions and millions and millions of years. To try and circumvent that, to me, is, um, is just kind of foolhardy and may, you know, may lead to a false sense of uh, satisfaction or false sense of security. Uh, now, when it comes to measuring, I mean, I, uh, I've, I've had some of the sleep measuring devices tell me I got zero deep sleep for three nights in a row. I'm like, well, I should be dead, and I feel pretty good. Um, and, I, and, I, and I woke up feeling pretty good. I've had, you know, some of the heart rate variability monitors tell me it was a great day to go a workout, but those, those monitors didn't know that I have premature ventricular contractions. Uh, and I skip every third beat if I get a certain, to a certain level. Mm -hmm. And so the worst thing I could have done was gone for a workout when it told me I was looking good. Hmm. Um, you know, I, the, um, I have friends who, you know, will wear a Fitbit to dinner and they're like, oh, I got 14,000 steps today. I was hoping to get 20. So I'm going to cut dinner short and I'm going to walk 6,000 more steps, you know, before I get home tonight. And I'm like, well, that's, I guess that's admirable, but that's not how, how I want to 
finish off a beautiful meal at a French restaurant in the south of France, right? So yeah. um, a lot of these things tend to be, it's, it's almost like the gamification of life now. And I'm like, yeah. no, I really, to me, the essence of everything is how do you feel? So Tara, how do you feel, you know, after you did the marathon? How do you feel mm-hmm. when you, you know, ate a beautiful meal? How do you feel when you wake up from a night's, uh, a night's sleep? Um, and all of these things, I don't need a device to tell me um, I feel great or that, um, or that I'm a piece of shit because I didn't get my full requisite number of steps in. Uh, and, you know, because some people get really attached to their, to their devices. Some people get into these, you know, challenge apps where everybody's trying to beat everybody else, you know, in the number of steps or the number of miles or the number of calories they burn over a period of days. Um, and I'm, I'm really all about uh, what's, the, what's the way that I can get the most amount of, of uh, pleasure, enjoyment, contentment, fulfillment, satisfaction out of every moment possible um, and do that uh, intuitively in my brain without having yeah. someone else tell me that I did a good job or some device, you know, send me some kudos or give me a couple of extra points to buy something because I, you know, <laughs> met my, my goals for the day. I'm, uh, I, you know, I hate to sound old school on this, but my goal for every one of the people who follows me is to get you to the point where you don't have to think about, well, what would Mark do? Or what would Mark say? Or what would Mark's advice be? I want you to be intuitive. Like every bite of food you take, um, you not only enjoy fully, but you also appreciate it for what it is and not have any second thoughts about it, not having any misgivings about it, not have to go back and do some math about, oh my God, I, you know, I hate, I just ate a third of a cheesecake and what, how many calories is that? How many fat calories is that? How many, you know, polyunsaturated fat grams? No, I want people to, at the end of a day, at the end of a meal go, man, I had a fantastic day. Um, I'm a human being. Uh, I'm not a machine. I dialed it in. I enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I hung out with friends. I was productive at work. I had great sex with my partner um, I, you know, I pet my dog. I mean, I had all these wonderful life experiences. Every bite of food I ate tasted great. I got a great uh, workout in where it was fun. It wasn't drudgery. That's what I'm after. You know, that's my, that's my goal. Yeah. I think those are such solid words of wisdom, especially right now, because everybody's got to have a message now, right? It's the information age. I think they say now there's as much content put out in a day as there were, was in like a, a hundred years <laughs> in like the 1800s or something without the amount of podcasts and books and blogs right. and, you know, social media content. And I, this is as a coach, this is something that I deal with almost daily. My clients will come, new clients will come and they'll request and they'll just say, I'm just so overwhelmed. I'm so confused. They have so much self doubt. They're like, I'm hearing this from Dr. Mercola and this from Thomas DeLauer and this from Drew Manning and this from you and this from Mark Sisson and this from Rob Wolf. And I don't know what to do. And, and like yeah. that question that you asked is so key is how do you feel, you know? And I think that getting people back and rooted into themselves is such wisdom, especially right now, because I do think we're losing, we're losing touch with that. It's like the self doubt has gone to the max as we've relied on external sources to tell us how we feel. Absolutely. And and At the end of the day, um, you know, why are we here? We're here to, you know, experience the joy and pleasure of life and probably, and, and I would I would argue that we're also here to diminish the pain and suffering as much as we can. Mm-hmm. And if pain and suffering includes feeling guilty or feeling uh, frustrated or feeling, you know, uh, upset at 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 choices you've made in the past or currently, mm-hmm. um, you know, how do we how are we able to overcome that? And I think we overcome it through education and through understanding and through understanding of how. Each of us is unique and individual. And that's the, you know, that's the beauty of, as you say, I mean, you know, Mercola and DeLauer and myself and Rob Wolf, we all offer what amounts to a template from which you can experiment. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of similarities in the templates that we offer and there's some differences. So anybody who's frustrated that they're you know, maybe following the wrong guru, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's really not even much more complicated than uh, and, you know, trying something out for 30 days, seeing if you like it, uh, seeing what works, picking out those things that work and getting, and getting yeah. rid of the things that don't work. 
hundred percent. All right. So that, that leads me to, and speaking of templates and things you can try out, can you explain your concept, um, about organ reserve and why weightlifting is important? Cause I find that so fascinating. We share. Yeah. Sure. Of course. So, um, and again, these are not, um, these aren't necessarily, you know, scientific principles you'll read about in a medical book. Um, this is an example of something that I've thought about for 40 years and I've kind of honed it and um, massaged it a little bit. But it, I, my, my goal here has, has always been to give, to take complex scientific terms and reduce them to, to bits of information that people can understand. So when, when, when we talk about organ reserve, um, again, the human body is a biological system and it's, it's you know, geared a, a certain way based on evolution, millions of years of evolution. We have a genetic recipe that, that, um, that wants us to do certain things. And um, one of the things that the body doesn't want us to do is it doesn't want us to waste energy. It's, again, it, it, it's, it was all designed under, under the um, uh, harsh conditions uh, over millennia where people didn't have access to a lot of food and energy was a precious commodity and you didn't want to waste energy. So the body does not want to waste energy building systems it doesn't need or doing things that it doesn't feel are, um, are, pr are prudent in terms of uh, thriving right now or surviving right now. So with that, with that in mind, um, when you uh, look at all the organs in the body, the heart beats according to the demands of the rest of the body to supply blood flow throughout the body. The lungs breathe in oxygen to supply oxygen so that the heart can pump the oxygen to the organs. The liver depends on certain demands uh, in order to have to keep pace with the demands of the body. Um, and all of this kind of revolves around muscle mass. Uh, it's muscles that cause, you know, that when you move, uh, there's energy that's required to make the muscles move. Uh, the energy has to come from somewhere. And so the, the lungs uh, have to you know, take in oxygen to provide oxygen so that the fat can be combusted in the muscle cells and create energy. Uh, the heart has to pump harder. The more work you do, the harder the heart must pump. And so all of this kind of uh, revolves around muscle mass. If you, if you, if you are in the gym lifting weights, uh, or out on the roads doing intervals, the, uh, the, the brain is sending a signal. You're consciously making this choice to do work that, let's be, let's be clear, the body doesn't really want to do because it right. wants to conserve energy. So you're sort of overcoming the general tendency of the body to sit on a sofa and do nothing. But by making this conscious choice to lift weights uh, or, or do sprints or run, uh, you're, you're suggesting that the muscles are going to be doing work. And in order to do the work, uh, the heart has to be faster. The lungs have to inspire greater. The liver has to process more fuel. Uh, the kidneys have to, um, you know, excrete more waste, waste material. And this is a system that then works together. And over time, as you, uh, as you, you know, get older, the idea here is you want to keep these systems at full operating capacity. Now, conversely, what happens is typically as we get older, we get into our 50s and 60s, we do less work, we get into our 70s and 80s, we give ourselves permission to not do any exercise at all. And as a result, um, the muscles atrophy because the body says, well, you know, if I'm not going uh, to lift weights and I'm not going to be compelled to do this amount of work, then uh, why should I maintain this muscle mass? And so the muscles atrophy, it's called sarcopenia. When the muscles atrophy, the bones to which the muscles are attached, the bones go, hey, I don't need to be structurally that sound because we're not doing that much work. We're not doing any weight-bearing activity. So the bones become brittle. We call this a loss of bone density. Uh, the heart says, we're not doing much work at all. I don't have to pump very hard at all. And, and so the, the heart starts to lose some of its capacity, its vital capacity, its energy, its organ reserve. Same with the lungs. The lungs that used to breathe four or five liters uh, of volume in every time you you breathe in, the lungs go well. There's no no there's no call for oxygen because there's no work being done now. So the lungs lose their uh, their reserve and they start to work at maybe ten or fifteen percent of capacity. Same with the liver. Same with same with all of these organs. And and as a result, um, you know the typical scenario that when I say typical, it's it's not unique. It's very typical. Is you're in your 80s and you get up in the middle of the night 
you know, to, to go to the bathroom um, and you trip over the cat or something like that and you fall. And because you, you lost your sense of balance, you don't, you're not able to correct yourself because you're not strong enough to, um, you know, to correct the fall. Uh, you fall and you, you break your hip. And now with a broken hip, uh, by the way, you break your hip because the hip is so brittle because you've lost bone density, right? Mm-hmm. So now you go to the hospital and invariably, uh, you know, you get, you get pneumonia. It's a very typical scenario with older people who, who break a bone and wind up in the hospital. You get pneumonia. Now, because your lungs aren't strong enough to cough out the sputum, um, you can't take in as much oxygen. The heart starts to have to work even harder, but it only has 10 or 15% of its reserve left. And so ultimately, you, you, you die of organ failure, not, not of old age, but organ failure because you neglected to maintain what I call this organ reserve over time. Um, it's, a sad, it's a sad tale, but it's also the reason that so many older people um, are succumbing to COVID right now because they don't have the lung capacity. Uh, they haven't done the work. You see, uh, you know, if you are able to do the work in the gym and you've got a good diet and you've maintained good, um, not just muscle mass and muscle strength, but bone density uh, and blood sugar control, um, you're less, you're less uh, at risk for a serious bout with the flu, for instance. Uh, so all these things come together um, to sort of prove my case that if you do the work in the gym, if you actually lift weights, do weight bearing activity um, and some high intensity um, sprinting once in a while, like the, 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 the sort of reality is you really don't even have to do a lot of aerobic stuff. You don't have to do the cardio that we talked about for so long. Um, and for so many decades, we thought was the be all and the end all of longevity. Like, oh, you got to do your cardio. No, it's really lifting weights. It's really maintaining this, this muscle mass and this organ reserve that confers such longevity and good health on, on people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. That, I think that's like the best holistic explanation of why you should lift weights that I've ever heard, right? Because there's lifting weights kind of has this like, oh, oh, so you're a vain person who likes to be in the gym all the time. Like that's not really necessary. That's kind of like a vanity thing. Sure, I'll do it every once in a while. But <laughs> what you're explaining there is like, no, if you love yourself, you'll yeah. get in the gym and lift some weights. Um, I had a, it reminded me of an experience I had hiking up a mountain one time. And of course I'm in some, some spiritual communities and I find weightlifting as a little bit resisted in some of the spiritual, <laughs> spiritual worlds. And, um, and I was thinking about that as I was going up a hike and I, I passed this woman and she was just she was very overweight and she was just huffing and puffing and had to take a break. And her husband or whoever she was with was, you know, he looked pretty fit and he's just waiting for her. And I thought I, my heart just broke for her in that moment. And I realized, I didn't even realize up until that point that I was just flying up the mountain. I not even think I wasn't thinking about the physical activity. I was lost in meditation, you know, yes. and I thought yeah. my, my intuition said, good for you getting in the gym daily in freezing cold Utah in the winter. So that now when the ice melts, you can go enjoy this and live your life without having to be held back by your body. And I think like the, the case for getting in the gym every day, I say, I'm like, it's great that you like tennis. It's great that you like to ski. It's great that you play basketball once a week with your buddies, but it's not enough. It's not enough. If you really want to enjoy life at its fullest level, you got to get in there and do some activity because we just won't. Otherwise we just won't. We just, even me and you, you know, we're regular workout people, but for 95% of our day, we're just sitting here. <laughs> yeah, and, we're, and we're not, we're not talking about a lot of work too. I mean, yeah. you know, it's amazing how much the body responds to um, short bouts of intense yeah. physical activity. Right. So I think from, you know, I wrote, I wrote the primal blueprint. Um, yeah well over 10 years ago. And, and I, and I came up with that, um, you know, um, lift heavy things and sprint once in a while and then move around a lot at a low level of activity. Mm. And, um, I, to this day, I think that twice a week is still the, still sort of the main, like if you can lift weights twice a week for anywhere from 20 minutes to 45 minutes, you're pretty much good to go. You know, and mm-hmm. if you can sprint once a week, do an all out physical activity, mm-hmm. like 10 or 20 or 30 seconds on a, on a yep. treadmill, on a track, uh, in the swimming pool, uh, on a, on a, uh, you know, an elliptical, um, whatever it is, these are pretty, um, I, I would say that the, the full amount of, t- of time under load to get these results is less than an hour aggregate every week. Yep. Now, again, it's 20 minutes or 40 minutes twice a week, and it's a couple of, 
you know, warm ups and a couple of uh, sets, but still the time under load, the actual time you're actually yeah. working hard is less than an hour a week. True, true. Yeah, Very I love doable. it. I 100% agree. That's exactly how I design my clients' programs is two days of lifting and one day of high intensity interval training. And the rest is just walk, go to yoga on Saturdays. Yeah. I love yeah, it. Yeah, move, move around a lot at a low level. And, and again, for those people, take that damn Fitbit off. Don't like, <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not about calories burned. It's not even about yeah. steps. It's just about moving through space, you know, moving as, in as many planes and, and rotations as you can. Hundred percent. Okay. Last thing, I just have to ask you this because it's it's. I'm just being selfish right now, but I know a lot of my listeners will enjoy. Can you can you share a little bit of your entrepreneurial journey from your beginning? Because L L Russ, who connected us, who hosts your Primal Blueprint podcast and co-hosts um, my other podcast, Kick Ass Life, with me, she was telling me she's like, when Mark got started, I mean, he was a personal trainer and he was packing supplements in his condo, and I'm like, ah, oh, it's so inspiring, you know, all the way to Primal Kitchen. Can you share a little bit of that journey and what that was like and what you learned in that process that might be valuable for other entrepreneurs in the health space? Sure. Well, it's a long journey. I mean, um, you know, and it's, I've always been entrepreneurial. So I, uh, you know, I, I was mowing lawns 40 hours a week in the summers when I was 12 years old, I was painting houses <laughs> Love it. 40 hours a week when I was from the age of 14 or 15, all the way up through, <laughs> I literally was painting houses in my uh, mid twenties as a, as I was, uh, competing in, uh, in, wow you know, elite sports. I funded my travels with, uh, as being a contractor, wow. uh, started a supplement company about 25 years ago, um, initially designed to build supplements for athletes to help improve their recovery from training. But over time realized that most of my, uh, my clients were people who were interested in the anti-aging aspects of these supplements that I was making. Um, you know, then I, I, I've always written books on training. I've, probably written 15 books now, but, uh, initial, the initial books I, I wrote were on how to, how to, uh, perform better mm -hmm. as an athlete. So that was kind of the, the main impetus for my writing. And, and that evolved into, um, a, a, a theory that I had about how all people could train as athletes, uh, and optimize their, uh, genetic, you know, capabilities mm -hmm. by picking those sorts of activities that had the greatest reward, the greatest benefit for training. And so, you know, within uh, decades of, of this evolution, um, I started writing uh, Mark's Daily Apple, which was the blog and wherein I would espouse my, my thoughts and, and try and uh, distill all this scientific information into sound bites that people could use and, and improve their lives. Um, and I was selling supplements on Mark's Daily Apple uh, for a number of years. And then about, uh, I don't know, now it's five years ago, I uh, realized that I was writing so much about food and how to make food uh, the mainstay of your health program and how important it was and how important it was to be eating real food and how the one problem with real food is um, it's if you get rid of uh, pies and cakes and candies and cookies and sugars and sweetened beverages and all the industrial seed oils, you know, you come down to a fairly small list of foods that you could eat that are going to uh, be nourishing and, and fulfilling, mm -hmm. and that the way to make those foods uh, palatable and make that way of eating sustainable is the methods of preparation, the sauces, the dressings, the toppings, mm -hmm. um, the herbs and the spices and all the things that give food such amazing flavor. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I started by writing cookbooks, and I wrote um, um, Healthy sauces, dressings, and toppings was the was the title of one of my, my second cookbook. Ah. Um, but in 2014, 2015, I realized, you know, I, I, nobody's making these sorts of better for nope. you condiments and dressings and things. And people were trying. I mean, some of the co companies were trying, but they weren't. They didn't fit my bill. You know, they weren't. Mm -hmm. They were still using canola and, yeah. and soybean oil and safflower and sunflower. Uh, or they still, you know, they were, they were maybe, um, better for you, uh, condiments that tasted like crap because they mm -hmm. couldn't figure out how to get the taste part of it. Right. <laughs> right. And so we, we set about to create Primal Kitchen, which was, uh, an opportunity to take all of these, um, condiments, you know, from ketchup and mayonnaise and mustard and salad dressings and pasta sauces and things like that, things that you put on food to make it taste better and figure out a way if we could not only make them taste better, but make them better for you. And I think we succeeded tremendously in that. And so we, mm -hmm. we created this line of product based um, initially on, um, uh, on avocado oil. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it's, now we've branched out into some, into some other more functional foods. 
But um, yeah, it, it, I mean, it grew from nothing. We launched our first product in 2015. Uh, and by the end of 2018, uh, Kraft had made an offer that I couldn't refuse uh, to buy the company. So it was a pretty rapid rise. Yeah. But, but as I say, um, you know, the popularity of it was, was built on 10 years of brand building with Mark Staley mm-hmm. Apple before mm-hmm. we launched the mayonnaise. Yeah. Wow. And you, you solve such a problem there. Like we're all grateful for it. My, my, all of my programs are just riddled with primal kitchen products. Cause it's so nice to know that you can just trust that it's going to have good stuff in it. You don't even have to bat yeah, an eye, yeah. you know? So that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. Like that whole journey all in primal endurance, by the way, was the first book of yours oh, that, good. that I read. That was my intro. And I was like, wow, this is different. I like this. I like this yeah. kind of talk. <laughs> yeah. It gave you permission to, to, to do fewer miles, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Just stop trying so freaking hard all the time. Yeah. You know, it was like, yeah. oh, less is more. Okay. I'm listening. I'm listening. Um, man, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, th- I guess the other thing I want to mention is your primal health coaching Institute. I have clients who are going through it right now. Um, I was actually in primal health coach radio recently, had such a good time with those ladies. Um, what can, where can people find out more about that? Uh, yeah. So it's a primal health coach Institute and it's an uh, online learning experience where we we, we download all the stuff that's been in my brain for 25 years into a very robust course that you take. It's self-paced. It's online. Uh, and we, we essentially certify people to become health coaches and deal with uh, and, and work with, with, with other people. I mean, there's never been a better time in history, uh, more, a more important time either, to be um, working with clients, as you well know, uh, who are concerned not now, just not just about weight loss and and, uh, you know, blood sugar levels and, uh, you know, cholesterol levels, but literally their immune system. I mean, and how do you, how do you build a, a robust immune system in, the, in this, yeah. in the context of what's going on in the world right now? So we, we train people to become coaches and we have the science is impeccable. We've had many physicians uh, go through the program and say it was, you know, one of the best courses they'd ever taken. We also have a business building section of it. So we help you build nice. a business and, um, a very robust coaching section where we we literally kind of walk you through that process of working one on one with clients and asking the sorts of questions that are going to elicit the responses that are going to put them on the path to better health. Yeah, that's amazing. That's the one that when people say like, "What what should I do, Tara? Which certification should I get?" I'm like, "Well, if you want, if you like my stuff, just do primal <laughs> primal coach health coaching. It's going to be yeah. the most yeah. aligned that I can find." <laughs> yeah. So, so just uh, just Google Primal Health Coach Institute, and uh, all of our links will come up there. So. Okay, um, right on. And your excited. your latest book is Keto for Life with Brad Kearns. I had Brad on the podcast recently talking about that one. So if you guys want to hear all the pillars of that book, go listen to my ep- episode with Brad. Brad is awesome, by the way. He's such yeah. good vibes. <laughs> it's too bad. He, it's too bad he doesn't have a sense of humor. Yeah, not at all. No, he's not <laughs> fun or funny or totally like enjoyable to talk to 24 yeah. <laughs> seven. Um, and then of course, you know, Mark Staley, Apple guys, that's when I, when I actually want answers to something with health, I just put Mark Sisson at the end. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then Mark Staley Apple comes up and you get real health information instead of like Healthline or <laughs> the American Heart Association. Sorry to say it, but that's how I feel. I don't really want that mainstream education. Just put Mark Staley Apple and then you'll just find all the good stuff. Okay, guys? Uh, little, there's, a, there's a health hack. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, again, like where, where's the main place people go to find out everything Mark Sisson? Mark Staley Apple? Mark Staley Apple. Yeah, really. Okay. Yeah. All right. Right on. Thank you so much. All right. Appreciate thank you. It.